In recent years, the number of so-called school resource officers has ballooned. Schools are supposed to be a place for kids to learn, to be challenged, and to grow. Yet if one looks closely at the roots of the school system, it becomes clear that the institution puts a higher premium on conformity, on a student who consumes and regurgitates what they're told, based more and more often on criteria set by bureaucrats in D.C. It's costly and difficult to control a population physically through use of arms. Key to the perpetuation and consolidation of political power is to control the mind. For more background on how this situation was arrived at, see the excellent video, The American Way, and check out the writings of John Taylor Gatto. Today there are over 10,000 school liaison employees. Some say this development has transitioned schools into correctional facilities. And while the stated intention of creating a safe environment is admirable, as is true for cops outside of school walls, the incentive for those within the school walls is not to serve or protect, but to target those who disobey. When the only tool had is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Such are the incentives of a course of monopoly. Introduce that mindset into an environment with ridiculous zero-tolerance policies and you have a bad combination. In Texas, where school liaison employees annually write over 100,000 citations to students, the head of the Supreme Court, Wallace Jefferson, noted, we are criminalizing our children for nonviolent offenses. Police are trained to escalate situations until compliance is gained. In Stockton, California, school liaison employee Frank Gordo sat down to have a conversation with a five-year-old boy. After Gordo put his hand on the boy's hand, the boy pushed Gordo's hand away and kicked him on the knee. Gordo responded by zip-tying the boy for over an hour and charging him with battery. If you did that to a five-year-old child, would that be permissible? In Washington, D.C., police liaison employee Bailey, upset at a verbal response from a 10-year-old, grabbed the student by the back of his head and slammed it off the table. The student reported the incident to his teacher, but was told she couldn't act as it involved a police employee. Later that day, when the boy was brought to the hospital by his mom, after complaining of a headache and sleepiness, it was discovered that he had had a concussion. If you had slammed the head of a 10-year-old off a table, don't you think the teacher might have reacted different? In Manchester, New Hampshire, school liaison employee Darren Murphy slammed a student's head off a cafeteria table for swearing. There, too, school administrators sided with the aggressor. Murphy faced no repercussions and was back to keeping the school safe the very next day. In Mississippi, a girl with sleep apnea fell asleep when reading a book in class. She was eventually asked to leave. When in the hall on the phone with her mom, someone swiped at her backpack. The girl didn't turn around, but said, leave me alone. The person behind her was school liaison employee Chris Bryant, who shoved her face first into a filing cabinet, then handcuffed her. After the girl threw up from the trauma, she was brought to a children's hospital and had her arm immobilized. These are just a handful of the examples of police employee aggression and unaccountability inside of schools. Police are actively targeting parents whose kids are said to be truant. After all, time spent in government schools is crucial to the indoctrination of the next generation. In Orange County, California, parents of students who weren't present as dictated face up to a year in a cage. A recent truancy sweep involved at least seven agencies, but hey, it's for their own good, right? The men and women still pretending that the disastrous war on some substances is feasible have subjected students to their erroneous ways. In Goose Creek, South Carolina, police conducted a raid under the pretense of seizing drugs. They had coordinated with school administrators ahead of time. Over 100 students in the hall were ordered on the floor. Over a dozen were handcuffed. Some had guns pointed at their heads. No drugs were found and no apologies were given. What would that be called if you and your friends went into a school and handled kids in that way? In Indiana, an 11-year-old boy who had had cannabis on his person was bitten by a police dog. The cannabis had been placed there by the dog's handler as part of a simulated raid. Is that the kind of thing you want your kid to be desensitized about, a raid? Is a world where that is commonplace ideal? Would you let me come around your kid with a dog trained to be aggressive and think it alright if I planted drugs on them and told them to be chill while I led the dog around them? The act is no different if the handler happens to wear a badge. In the LAPD, the same outfit that introduced SWAT units, started the practice of placing undercover police employees in schools posing as students. Their goal? To bust kids selling substances deemed illicit. This includes one Florida student who, though he didn't use cannabis himself, procured some and gave it for free to a female he fell in love with. Turns out, she was a cop. In the end, he and 30 others were arrested. In the post-9-11 security theater, school resource officers like to see themselves as being on the front lines. 
Organizations now exist to capitalize on the sector of the police state. One, the National Association of School Resource Officers offers training classes and lists as the first presentation item preparation for international and domestic terrorism. It should be clear, at least to those of us who haven't just been exposed to government education, just who are the real terrorists. As of taking a cue from our friends at Fusion Centers, a database called InBloom is being implemented in school districts. The software tracks over 400 metrics about each student, but don't worry, they promise that the information won't be shared. And administrators in one school, which had distributed laptops to students, spied on over 40 students through the built-in camera. So what are some solutions? I know some will say, but it's important that these kids be in school. But whose kids are these? The states? A faceless entity answerable to no one? Are all proclamations made by such folks legitimate? What if parents were told that their children had to be present in school for 9 hours a day, or 11 hours a day? What if parents were told that, to mitigate distractions during the school year, their children would be taken and placed in government-run boarding houses? What if parents were told that their kids had to participate in a youth service program to show their allegiance? If you have kids and you are a firearm owner, consider this question. If asked, would you turn over your guns to a government agent for a third of the day? I'd guess not. Yet are you now currently willing to hand off something even more important? your child, and their mind to these same people? Education doesn't just happen in a building called a school. And in fact, the information pushed there is patently full of omissions and misinformation to fit the status quo. As John Holt said, compulsory schooling, compulsory learning, is a tyranny and a crime against the human mind and spirit. Let all those escape it who can, any way they can. If you have kids, consider homeschooling, or better yet, unschooling. And if you're not a fan of the police state and the incursion of police employees into schools, Learn about peaceful parenting. Also, many kids now have smartphones. Make sure they download a free streaming app and encourage them to use it should they or their friends or classmates ever be confronted by a police employee. 50 cent, too short, all of them talk about Glock 40. Okay, I'm the only one in this room professional enough that I know of to carry this Glock 40. I'm the only one. <laughs> I, I,